Good morning, Council. I'm Judge Dennis, and together with Judge Weiner and Judge Duncan. Good morning. I'm Judge Dennis, uh, your, your panel this morning. We welcome you to the Fifth Circuit, and we'll call your case. Kenneth Wayne Hawkins et al. versus the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development. Here first from Mr. Hawkins. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. I'm sorry. Ms. Miles, for Mr. Hawkins. Yes, yes, Your Honor. Good morning. May it please the court. My name is Kimberly Brown Miles, and I represent the appellants, plaintiffs in this matter along with my colleague, Velimir Rosich, and Daniel Bashara PC. Plaintiffs are residents of Copper Tree Village Apartments, a privately owned complex that receives a project-based rental assistance subsidy from HUD. Plaintiffs have contracted with the complex to receive decent, safe, and sanitary units as mandated by HUD regulations and the housing assistance payment contract between HUD and the owner. The tenant's qualification for housing assistance is tied to this complex, and if the tenant leaves, they will lose their subsidy. The amended complaint in this matter pleads that HUD has not provided plaintiffs with decent, safe, and sanitary housing. The record reveals that HUD knows that the housing is not decent, safe, and sanitary, and has provided the owner with two notices of default. The owner failed to complete the corrective action specified in the notices of default within the time period allowed in both notices. No extensions of time granted by HUD are in the appellate record. The units continue to present imminent health and safety risks to residents. The amended complaint further pleads that plaintiffs have requested relocation assistance from HUD in the form of comments. HUD has denied plaintiffs' request for assistance. Plaintiffs are requesting judicial review of HUD's denial of relocation assistance. Copper Tree is located in a predominantly minority census tract. The living conditions at Copper Tree affect 87% Black tenants. Conversely, HUD is providing decent, safe, and sanitary housing to white PBRA tenants in the Woodlands. HUD is providing better treatment to similarly situated white PBRA tenants by providing them with decent, safe, and sanitary housing and is not providing decent, safe, and sanitary housing to Black plaintiffs at Copper Tree. HUD admits in its brief that the Appropriations Act permits authorization of tenant protection vouchers without abatement of the contract or enforcement action by HUD beyond a notices of default already issued to the owner. The prerequisites of the act have been met. The owner has received two notices of default and the complex still presents imminent health and safety risks to tenants. Issuance of tenant protection vouchers under the Consolidated Appropriations Act would allow the plaintiffs to access decent, safe and sanitary housing. HUD's final agency action is exactly the type of claim subject to judicial review under Weyerhaeuser v. U.S. Wildlife, based on the agency not considering the factors set forth in the statute and guiding its decision to withhold assistance. I mean, what is, Ms. Miles, what is the final agency action here? The withholding of relocation assistance from the plaintiffs at Copper Tree. Molly, can I look to a document or a decision or a ruling by the agency that says that, or are we just sort of inferring that there's been final agency action? There is no specific document that says that, Your Honor. Um, on October 18, 2018, in the appellate record, the HUD sent um, a notice to Copper Tree tenants requesting comments mm -hmm. on um, advising them of the notices of default. That's uh, in the record at 111 to 112. Advising them of the notice of default and the corrective actions that the owner is mandated to make. The the plaintiffs submitted comments to HUD in response to their request and requested relocation assistance. HUD did not respond at all. Um, in terms of final agency action as defined under the Act, an agency action can be defined as a denial of relief under Section 551.13. Um, the denial of rel the relief in this case that the plaintiffs were requesting were, were the tenant protection vouchers, which would allow them to access decent, safe, and sanitary housing. Um, relief when, when HUD is, and look, I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I mean, the, the, the conditions in this, uh, in this uh, complex sound deplorable. 
Um, yeah. But and, and when HUD is in that situation where you've got notices of default, does it have a menu of options to try to, in other words, does it, does it have a number of tools in the toolkit where it can say, this is what we're going to do to try to improve the situation? Yes, Your Honor. And that is within HUD's discretion. HUD has a myriad of enforcement um, options. Like, like what, for example? What, what can it do? Um, it can, um, as, as far as I understand, they can um, put the owner on a plan to, to uh, make action. So actually, the notices of default themselves give the owner a specified time period. So in the record, there are two notices of default that we, that we cited in the amended complaint. The October 3rd notice of default, which gave them 30 days to make the corrective actions. And then the October 9th the notice of default, 2018 as well that gave them 60 days. They did, the owner did not make the corrective actions in the notices of default. So in the uh, Appropriations Act, there are a myriad of options that are um, that the owner has. However, and that's that section, I believe 1034 to 1035. So, so I, I agree with you that there are many things that the owner might have to do. The, the, the granting of vouchers, relocation vouchers, I mean, no, I, correct me if I'm wrong. Is there anywhere in the reg where it, it says the owner must do this? <clears throat> 24 CFR 86.323, the, the regulation specifically states that if a, if a family wishes to be rehoused following the issuance of a notice of default to the owner, that they haven't kept the dwelling unit in decent, safe, and sanitary conditions, that HUD shall provide the assistance. Now, that regulation doesn't specify tenant protection vouchers. But if what the 2018, 2019, and 2020 Appropriations Act um, provides in a separate section than the specified options that the owner has, that, that HUD can make with the owner with respect to its enforcement, uh, Section 1010 of the Appropriations Act, it provides specific standards that, that um, HUD may uh, consider with respect to issuing relocation assistance to get folks out of these conditions. So the first standard is that the owner has received a notice of default that has been met. The second is whether the complex still presents imminent health and safety risks to tenants. HUD has not provided any evidence that the, to counteract our evidence that the complex still presents imminent health hey, and safety that, That's good. So the, sec, the reg that you're referring to, 886.323E, in yes. your view, that doesn't come into play only when there has been abatement of the contract? No, Your Honor, it does not. The regulation, the plain language of the regulation itself does not state that abatement is necessary. Um, in addition, HUD was um, mandated to uh, create guidance for the agency to follow. In HUD Notice 2018-09, that's specified in the plaintiff's um, amended complaint and in our briefing, where it follows the uh, language of the Appropriations Act, indicating that HUD can issue the vouchers um, where the owner has received a notice of default and, and their imminent health and safety risk presented to the residents of that PBRA complex. Senator Marco Rubio, who uh, presented this amendment to Congress, specifically did it for these circumstances so that folks would not have to wait for a HUD to, so that there would be funding available for HUD to comply with its own regulation. There may have not been funding in the past. I guess I hear what you're saying. Just going back to the reg that you, I mean, you helpfully cited the reg, it does say shall. Yes, you're right. Yes, the you're sentence right. right before that says, HUD may exercise any of its rights or remedies under the contract or regulatory agreement, if any, including abatement of housing assistance payments, even if the family continues to occupy the unit and rescission of the sale. If, however, the family wishes to be rehoused in another dwelling unit, HUD shall provide assistance in finding such a unit for the family. The family doesn't refer back to the last sentence where there's been abatement? No, Your Honor, it does, it does not. Um, it, it is a separate uh, section. And again, HUD itself in its later regulation following the um, the mandate in the Appropriations Act for it to provide guidance to the agency in terms of issuing the vouchers um, indicates that it, that abatement is not necessary, particularly in that HUD notice, HUD distinguishes between replacement vouchers and relocation vouchers. 
So if the uh, owner never comes into compliance with the HUD, uh, with HUD standards, then the vouchers are replacement housing for folks in the community. If the owner does come into compliance with HUD standards and the housing assistance payment contract continues to be paid by HUD, then those vouchers issued to those families are, are relocation vouchers and are subject to the sunset provisions. And then they terminate when those families are not um, no longer eligible for voucher assistance. Okay. So HUD that, that's great. I'll, I'll ask the government about the HUD notice. Yes, Your Honor. That's helpful. Thanks. Thanks. Um, HUD's final agency action of withholding relocation assistance also violates HUD's statutory mandate to affirmatively further fair housing. HUD's payment for housing at Copper Tree subjects Black tenants to uninhabitable living conditions. This is a part of HUD's pattern for paying for substandard housing for Black tenants in Black neighborhoods, while paying for habitable housing for white tenants in white neighborhoods. HUD has a duty under Section 3608E of the Fair Housing Act to evaluate its denial of relocation assistance to these Black tenants living in uninhabitable conditions. And its effect of that decision on the lack of housing opportunities that are not in unequal conditions. NAACP v. HUD, a First Circuit case, held that HUD's discretionary administration of its grant programs can be reviewed for abuse of discretion under Section 3706 of the APA. However, the district court in this matter applied ADAPT v. HUD. ADAPT is not applicable. ADAPT is, uh, in ADAPT, the plaintiffs did not point to a specific decision or decisions that HUD made to, um, to not investigate um, grantees with respect to um, them not following grant requirements according to Section 504 and HUD's failure to take enforcement actions against those grantees. This is distinguishable from the facts in our case and that we're not asking HUD to take further actions against the owner. The prerequisites have been met already just by HUD uh, issuing the notices of default for the plaintiffs to be qualified for relocation assistance. Here, HUD's specific decision to withhold relocation assistance perpetuates its pattern of paying for unequal and substandard housing to Black PBRA tenants in Houston and is reviewable under Section 7062 because these actions are contrary to HUD's mandate to affirmatively further fair housing. HUD's withholding of relocation assistance also violates Section 3604 of the Fair Housing Act and is subject to judicial review. HUD is making decent, safe, and sanitary housing unavailable to plaintiffs because of race. HUD knows that the copper tree units are not decent, safe, and sanitary pursuant to its own inspections. The conditions have been met by both the HUD regulation and the Consolidated Appropriations Act to pay for the tenant protection vouchers. No white tenants are subject to these horrific living conditions. So I assume you're talking about the race discrimination claim now? I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the fair housing claim that we've also asked for okay. judicial review of under the under So you're, you're talking about the substandard living conditions with respect to a complex that is occupied by majority black tenants. Yes, Your Honor. A, a, as compared to the living conditions in, uh, in other uh, complexes uh, that are uh, occupied by majority white tenants. Yes, Your Honor. No, my, I guess my difficulty with that is I thought we were talking about the issuance of vouchers. Yes, and, Your Honor. And so I wonder, I'm wondering if, if you are alleging that uh, white tenants are getting vouchers under circumstances where the, uh, the black tenants are not being given the vouchers. No, Your Honor. That is not the similarly situated okay. characteristic that we're alleging. Okay, I see. Uh, the white tenants um, in the PBRA complexes in the Woodlands do not need tenant protection vouchers because they already have access to decent, safe, and sanitary housing. Um, our tenants, uh, our plaintiffs, do need the vouchers just to access decent, safe, and sanitary housing. If HUD chose to uh, relocate them to PBRAs that were decent, safe, and sanitary pursuant to HUD rules, then that would be uh, satisfactory under HUD's own regulation, but HUD is not doing that. Um, and what we're, why we're asking for specifically the tenant protection vouchers is that there's money afforded to HUD to do that. This $85 million appropriation specific to those vouchers is not a part of HUD's total voucher funding. And the vouchers, and the, I'm sorry, that particular appropriation has meaningful standards 
for HUD to follow and for the court to order HUD to, to um, consider with respect to issuance to the tenants so that they can have access um, to this um, funding. You're not bringing a, um, you're bringing a disparate treatment claim, not a disparate impact claim. Right? A disparate treatment claim, yes, Your Honor. You're not bringing a disparate impact claim? No, Your Honor, we are not. Thanks. Um, um, we're also, as, as stated uh, just now, we're stating that, again, that we've pled plausible facts for a plausible claim of intentional discrimination against HUD based on HUD providing decent, safe, and sanitary housing to white tenants in PBRAs and white areas. And those tenants, again, don't need volunteer assistance because they already have access to decent, safe, and sanitary housing. The similarly situated characteristic pled is tenancy in a HUD-funded project. Um, again. Well, you've exceeded your time. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Sandberg. Good morning, may it please the court. I'm Jeff Sandberg for the United States. Um, plaintiff's exact theories during this litigation have been uh, a little bit of a moving target and hard to pin down, um, but they've gestured in, in various directions and trying to escape unreviewability of their claims and, and now seem to be very focused on the availability of appropriations in the paragraph two appropriation for relocation vouchers as opposed to seeking the uh, remedy of abatement of the contract, um, which would terminate payments to the landlord. Um, and, and require all the tenants to move. Um, I wanna get one thing clear right from the outset, which is that HUD is not the owner of these projects. So Judge uh, Duncan, when you said, you know, what does the owner have to do under regulation 886-323? The owner, this is private subsidized housing and these, these tenants have a contract, not with HUD, but with private landlords. So they could, if they wish, sue their, their landlords for having inadequate conditions. And it's, it's a bit odd that they had actually sued the landlord as part of this case originally, but then, then chose to drop them. So yeah, it's important no, to keep that right. in mind. I, I, I'm sure I misspoke many times, and I, I always like to misspeak in my questions, <laughs> so, the, so the lawyers <laughs> can correct me. <laughs> but, it's uh, it's, well, it's, it's know, relevant for things, for things like the constitutional claim, where they're saying, look at this sure. housing in the woodlands that's being maintained by private landlords in good condition, and HUD hasn't, is, HUD, HUD hasn't lifted a finger there. And they're arguing, look at Copper Tree Village, HUD also hasn't lifted a finger there. Well, at least in the precise way we would like, which is to issue relocation vouchers. Instead, HUD has undertaken its normal enforcement remedies. They're, they're not comparing, you know, apples and, and apples yeah. there. They're you know, uh, my one of my concerns was, well, I, it seems that the final agency action and the committed to agency discretion are sort of related or overlapping ideas here. Um, so, let, let me ask you, when, when I, I, one concern that I had was, well, where is the requirement that the, uh, the house, the vouchers be given? Um, I was referred to a reg, which I had read already, uh, 886.323, and it does say shall, if, however, the family wishes to be rehoused in another dwelling unit, <coughs> HUD shall provide assistance. So what's your response to that? Why doesn't that create the sort of uh, confinement of discretion uh, of the there, there, there are a number of both textual and contextual reasons why it doesn't. Starting with the text, that sentence begins with, if, however, the family, however, is a reference back to the logical idea contained in the previous sentence, the family is the same family that was just mentioned. Um, so tech, and it's, it's not broken out in a separate subsection of 86.323. This is a continuation of a single logical thought, and there's a period in the middle of it rather than a comma to make it more readable. Uh, the contextual, uh, which is pretty conclusive factors are at the time this regulation was promulgated in 1979, the only way HUD would ever have money to relocate families would be if they abated the contract. There was no authority it, that didn't come into being until, you know, Senator Rubio's amendment in, in 2016. To, to use funds uh, to relocate a family unless abatement had happened. And if you look at the preamble to the 1979 rule, 44 Federal Register uh, 7363, there's a section talking about effects on the eligible family if the contract is terminated. And it says, uh, HUD will provide assistance in finding eligible families, suitable units and other buildings in the event assistance payments are abated. Abated means stop paying the landlord those tenants then lose their ability to live in the housing with with subsidized housing and everybody everybody there has to move away um it then says it is the department's intention to work with owners tenants and other interested parties to the extent possible to forestall such action meaning hud's long-standing policy has been to try to keep 
uh, paying on, on, on the building if it thinks it can work with the tenants and the owner to do so. And I would note that if you abate the contract, it's sort of a one size fits all solution. All of those tenants there, whether they want to move or not, and there, there are 263 units at issue here, it's not just a handful of, of, of plaintiffs uh, who, who brought this lawsuit that, are, that HUD has to think about. Um, if, if HUD abates the whole contract, basically everyone there has to move. Um, so it's true. It, it's true, as plaintiffs have pointed out, that HUD has an additional tool in its toolkit, which is it has the option to um, both continue to pay the landlord for the units and to offer relocation vouchers to plaintiffs if, if it sees fit to do so. But there's nothing in the statute that requires HUD to exercise that option. And the HUD um, notice 2018-09 that um, plaintiffs counsel has referred to on page seven there's a, there's a single paragraph that notes that HUD has that authority. HUD knows it has its that authority, but it just says the 2018 Act provides that HUD may provide tenant protection vouchers for families in the conditions specified in the Appropriations Act. And there's not, Congress didn't say, you know, HUD, in considering whether to avail itself of this proviso, you must consider, you know, economic impact on, on this or geographic impact or different areas of the country, the length of the duration of the violation or anything. I mean, if, 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 Congress had said, here's what you need to weigh HUD, then courts themselves would have standards to apply in deciding, okay, did HUD act reasonably in choosing to give money to these plaintiffs and not to other people? Uh, remember, this is a finite pot of funds. So if HUD spends the money on, on vouchers for these plaintiffs, it's not spending those funds on um, other uh, persons who are at risk of losing um, HUD, uh, assistance altogether. Uh, so there, there's simply no, you know, what, plaintiffs may have, you know, a, a reasonable policy argument to make that they should have been issued vouchers here. As it happens, HUD, you know, decided to work with the owner to, to remedy conditions and the, the complex subsequently passed HUD inspection on multiple occasions. Um, but but it's, 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 for, it's for plaintiffs to persuade HUD as a policy matter through the comment process that this is something that requires using that extraordinary tool in the toolkit. Um, and to seek remedies against the landlord if, if conditions aren't improving. Remember, this is you know this is a private complex. They can they can sue their landlord for for unlivable conditions. Um, so this isn't the kind of lawsuit that that can be brought uh, in court. In your view, um, is the argument that this decision is committed to agency's discretion under the APA? Is that alternative to there's no final agency action here? In other words, are those two alternative bases or or are there certain claims for which one argument applies and other to the that the other argument applies? They, they, they are alternative, and here's why. If if HUD had issued a letter here saying we have we are in receipt of a request for relocation mm -hmm. vouchers from you plaintiffs, we have given the matter consideration. You know, we are denying your request because we do not think there's an imminent risk to health and safety, or we don't think that this is a sufficient use of agency priorities, or, or whatever. That would then be final agency action, and we could have a fight about committed agency discretion, depending on the reasons that the agency gave. But at least there, there would be something that you'd be pointing at, right? The agency has purported to deny someone's rights, but the agency didn't issue such a letter, and it didn't have to issue such a letter. And the, the final agency action part of this case is really just the flip side of their failure to bring their claim under the right part of the APA, which is Section 706.1. Section 7061 says that you can bring suit to delay, or sorry, to compel agency action that has been unlawfully withheld or unreasonably delayed. So if you think, for example, HUD should either is required to issue you a benefit or is required to consider whether to issue you a benefit, you bring suit under 7061 to say, here's, you know, here's the statute or reg that says you're required to consider giving me this benefit or indeed you're required to give me this benefit. They can't point to any statute or regulation like that. And, and they disclaimed in, in district court, I, I suppose appropriately, that they weren't trying to bring a 7061 claim. But you can't bring, that, that's the only kind of claim you can bring when the agency hasn't acted. You can't reframe it as a 7062 claim and say that the final agency action is that the agency has failed to act. <clears throat> Thank you. Is that your um, Sorry, I guess I would just add on the constitutional claim, unless there are questions about the other parts of the case, um, that, that again, they, they the plaintiffs have made very clear that the action that they're challenging is the failure to provide them with relocation vouchers. And so you have, if in undertaking the, the 12B6 inquiry that this court laid out, and among other cases, the Lincoln property case recently, to, to figure out whether you have a plausible claim of race discrimination, you really have to have some inferences drawn from something that HUD was acting on the basis of race and HUD's own actions. 
And to point to the fact that private landlords are maintaining unspecified complexes in, although they're allegedly white majority, in good condition in the woodlands just isn't a basis for inferring that the decision not to um, provide relocation vouchers at, at Copper Tree Village um, was was discriminatory. I mean, you, like they're they're in communities 30 miles apart. They're associated with different public housing agencies. There's all manner of reasons to just sort of at the at the outset question why one should conclude that there's a plausible allegation of discrimination. And it really is, it's not enough for the plaintiffs to come forward with facts that they can spin in a way that is consistent with liability. They have to actually nudge their claim beyond the conceivable to the, the plausible. Um, if there are no further questions beyond that, we uh, rest on the brief and we ask that the judgment be affirmed. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sandberg. Ms. Biles, you have five minutes on the vote. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to address a couple um, um, matters that my colleague, Mr. Sandberg, um, mentioned in his in, in his presentation. Um, with respect to the uh, abatement language in the uh, regulation 86.323, we stand by the number one plain language of the statute, which does not require uh, abatement of the contract. And again, HUD's own regulation, I'm sorry, HUD's own notice um, that was um, uh, enacted in 2018 following the Appropriations Act makes it clear that abatement is not necessary in terms of HUD uh, issuing the tenant protection voucher assistance. So the mandatory language of the of the uh, HUD regulation, we stand by the plain language of the statute. And the uh, in HUD's brief, they cited a, a federal register uh, uh, notice but in that in that notice, the concern was that whether there would be funds for these tenants who have been displaced because of an owner not complying with HUD regulations. Um, and so the notice was indicating that there would be funds um, to rehouse those tenants if they were subject to abatement. Uh, 40 years later in this, now that we have the Appropriations Act, which provides funds who are subject to these um, conditions, there's funding now to rehouse these tenants in accordance with HUD's 886.323 regulation. Uh, with respect to the um, discretionary portion of the May, as, as indicated in the Appropriations Act, we're again, as explained in our brief, uh, relying on, number one, there's a basic presumption of judicial review. And that was most recently uh, explored again by the Supreme Court and Weyerhaeuser v. U.S. Wildlife. And what we're saying is that our case is similar to Weyerhaeuser and that we're and that HUD did not consider the, the relevant factors of the statute as set forth in the Consolidated Appropriations Act with respect to its discretionary um, decision to issue tenant protection vouchers to the, to the plaintiffs. Um, in addition, um, we're also, um, if you look at Norton, um, uh, <clears throat> the 2004 Supreme Court case, uh, uh, Justice Scalia noted in that case that when an agency is not complying with a land use plan um, under that type of um, non-compliance by the agency or an agency action not in compliance with um, an agency's land use plan is, again, an agency not acting in accordance with its own um, with its own plan is reviewable under section 7062. So we're stating that HUD has enacted in accordance with its regulation. And in addition, we're saying and it's been a, it's an abuse of discretion for HUD not to have considered um, the factors that set forth in the Appropriations Act in terms of its decision to not issue the funding. With respect to the, uh, the final agency action argument made by my colleague we stand by the fact that there is final agency action in this in this case. Final agency action requires um, two elements. One, that there's been a consummation of the agency's decision-making process. And two, that there are legal consequences or rights have been determined. Um, that's per Bennett v. Speer. <clears throat> First element has been met in that HUD issued the notices of default to the owner the owner did not comply within the time period specified in the notices of default. HUD considered that the owner didn't comply 
And then they also still were obviously well aware of the hazardous conditions present at the complex. Oh, and Ms. Miles, uh, Ms. Miles, sorry to interrupt. Mr. Sandberg represented to us that uh, since, so I guess subsequently to this, the complex has passed HUD review. Uh, that is not in the record, Your Honor. Okay. That's not in the appellate record. Okay, thanks. Yes, Your Honor. And again, and number two, in terms of the legal consequences to the tenants, there's been, um, the tenants are still having to endure um, imminent health and safety risk um, at the complex, which has not been countered by, by HUD in terms of the, the record. There's been the plaintiff's declarations have indicated that there's extreme security issues, um, extensive mold that's simply been painted over, um, inoperable appliances, inoperable smoke detectors, uh, damaged roofs, um, lead paint, electrical hazards, um, plumbing issues. All those issues are our plaintiffs are having to endure while being living at that complex. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Case will be submitted, and uh, we will call. The next case for the day.